One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! יברכך אדוני וישמרך, יאר אדוני פניו אליך ויחונקה, יישא אדוני פניו אליך וישם לך שלום. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday, and welcome to this edition of the NTEB House Church Sunday Morning Service. We're very glad that you're here with us. You know, many of us, after we get saved, we have moments in our life where we will start to doubt the promises of God that we read about in our King James Bible. Satan is always trying to take our faith in Jesus Christ away from us. And every once in a while, The doubts that he sows in our lives will sprout for a season. But there is a swift and speedy fix to this vexing problem. Instead of doubting our faith in our blood-bought church age and dispensationally correct eternal security in Jesus Christ, well, it's time to start doubting our doubts by resting on the promises that God makes in the Bible. Ephesians chapter 1, 12 through 14 says this, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Many Christians will go through a season of doubt, and they're rightly shocked when it's pointed out to them that their doubts make God a liar and his promises of none effect. The Bible, when rightly divided, shows you a 100% guarantee that if you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then nothing you can do, nothing you can think, or nothing you can say can ever change that. You can't take it back. (laughs) Why? Because you did nothing to earn your salvation. You do nothing to keep your salvation. And you did not seal yourself. That too is the action of the Almighty God. Go read Romans chapter 7 and chapter 8 and see exactly what the things are that can separate the born-again believer from the love of God. Nothing. That's what can separate you from Jesus Christ after salvation. Absolutely nothing. Today, I would like to bring you a message that will not only cause you to doubt your doubts, but to rejoice in your eternal security that was free to you, but cost him everything on the cross at Calvary. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you, God, for all these that you've gathered here today. And uh, Father God, we thank you. We thank you uh, that your word is true. And your truth is is right from the beginning. And you have sealed and preserved your word as a testament to your truth. And we can count on that, Lord. We can not only plan our days here on earth, but we can plan our eternity around what you have promised. And we come before you today, Lord, if there's anybody listening who does not know you as Savior, in full pardon and forgiveness of their sins. We pray, Lord, that something would be said and done to lead a lost soul to you. And if there's any saved believers who are listening to this program and they're going through a season of doubt, 
I pray, Lord, that the things that will be said and done here this morning, the scripture that will be spoken and preached and taught this morning, will cause that person to doubt their doubts and uh, to turn back in full trust to you, Father God. You're a good God, and your name is great and greatly to be praised. And we come before you, and we thank you and praise you for this time and for all these that you've gathered here. And we commit this time to you, Lord, and invite you in. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Glad that you're here today. We're going to be talking about the not just eternal security. Just about every single person who attends these broadcasts on a regular basis, they understand the Bible doctrine of eternal security. I'm not here to teach on eternal security this morning necessarily. We will touch on it, absolutely. But there's another component to Bible doctrine. There's another component to eternal security uh, that a lot of the times is overlooked. And that is believing what God has said to be true and that it is true. And when we doubt God, well, this is what the Bible says happens um, when we doubt the promises of God, first John chapter five, verses 10 through 12 tell us he that believeth on the son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he has believed not the record that God gave of his son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. First John five ten through 12 tells us that when we don't believe the record that God has given in his Son, Jesus Christ, then we make him a liar. Why? Because we don't believe what he's telling us. And this morning, I want to talk about um, having faith to believe in the promises of God. And over the years, I have seen many people make a profession in Jesus Christ, and they absolutely got saved. Romans 10, 13 says, He, um, uh, he that believes in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. And we're going to be spending some time in the book of Romans this morning and the book of Acts. And we're going to be looking at New Testament, blood-bought, born-again, dispensationally, rightly divided, um, correct Bible salvation for the uh, church-age believer. But every once in a while, people will get to a place where they will doubt the promises of God. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. The promises of God, they are true and faithful. The promises of God are yea and amen. And there is no shadow of doubt. There is no shadow of turning within him. He is 100% light and in him there is no darkness. That's the God that we serve. He said it. And you can hang your eternal destiny on the words that he has spoken. Glad you're with us here this morning.
Amen. I hope it's well with your soul this morning. And it certainly is well with your soul if you're born again today. The Bible says in John 3.16, this is where I got in 30 years ago. The Bible says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 2 Timothy 2.11 says, It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. God is faithful today. Did you know that? God has made you many, many promises. When you hold that King James Bible in your hand, one of the things that leaps out at you is that God is faithful. You may backslide on God. God never backslides on you. God never backslides on you because he's faithful. 2 Timothy 2.13, if we believe not, yet he abided faithful, he cannot deny himself. The Bible says about Jesus Christ that he is faithful and true. He is the Lord of lords and he is the King of kings and he is faithful and true. Revelation 19.11, and I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. One of my favorite hymns is, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Why? Because every time I hear this song, it reminds me that God, even when I'm not faithful, God is faithful. God never backslides on me. God is always there when I want to meet with him. When I call out, he is always there and he always answers. Why? Because he's faithful. And that's one of the things we're going to be looking at this morning is the faithfulness of God. And that because he is faithful. Says in the Old Testament, God says, because I change not, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. What is that talking about? It is talking about the faithfulness of God. God wants you to trust him today. And when you don't, you make him a liar because you you don't believe that he is faithful and true. And this morning, I want to bring a message and I really want to pump up your faith that when you read your King James Bible, the things that you read, you know that it's not just words on a piece of paper. But they are the preserved and recorded and written promises of Almighty God. Great is thy faithfulness. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been now forever. Summer and winter, springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in and fold a witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is 
That's Great Is Thy Faithfulness by Jimmy Needham. And if you haven't heard of Jimmy Needham before, he's a Christian artist and uh, he likes to do a lot of the old hymns and he does a little bit of a modern take on them. And I really appreciate uh, uh, the, the, the sophistication that he brings to these songs. And, and uh, it's great to see uh, contemporary Christian artists who are not ignoring the hymns of the faith, and that was Jimmy Needham with Great Is Thy Faithfulness. Today we're talking about the faithfulness of God. We're talking about when we doubt the promises of God, we make God a liar. Now that seems harsh, doesn't it? That seems like, wow, I'm just going through a season of doubt. I'm not calling God a liar. (laughs) Yes, you absolutely are. When you doubt the promises of God, the Bible says you make God a liar because you don't believe the record that God gave in his son, Jesus Christ. And, um, you know, when you think about that, that is harsh. That's that is a very blunt and very bold statement to make. But look at it from God's perspective. God spent fifteen hundred years of earth time to get his complete revelation written down in a book from 40 different men who wrote that book. The Bible says holy men of old wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And when you go all the way back to the book of Genesis, then all the way up to the book of Revelation, God spent a fair amount of time getting that written down in a book. He went to a lot of trouble to do that he didn't have to he could have just wiped us all out and started over but he didn't and that book that blood-bought book uh, that's the most precious thing that you have now you might say to me well no my salvation is my the most precious thing that I have really without that book you wouldn't be saved because you wouldn't know God Now, we don't worship the Bible. Absolutely not. We don't make an idol out of it. We don't fall down and bow to the Bible. We don't pray to the Bible. The Bible is not our idol. 
But <laughs> that said, I want you to think about how important that book is, that record of God that he has left for us. Those black words that are printed on a white page and bound up in a seven-sealed book. Without that book, you don't know about Jesus Christ. You don't know about God. You don't know about sin. You don't know about the penalty of sin and the consequences of sin. Without that book, you don't know about salvation. Without that book, you don't know about the friend that sticks closer than a brother. Without that book, God would have left you in your sins and you would have closed your eyes in death and woken up in the flames of hell. The hell that you wouldn't have known about without that book. So you see how important that book is? That's why we get crazy around here talking about Bible versions. That's why we stick to the King James Bible. Because that book is really the most important thing that you'll ever hold in your hand, the most important thing that you'll ever read. I remember when I got saved, and I've told this story many times, I'm not going to tell it again, but um, on my knees at, at midnight, I had an old Gideon's King James Bible that my dad had stolen from a hotel room 20 years earlier. And I opened that book, that seven-sealed black book with the red edges, with the white pages and the black print. And I read one verse of scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I believed one verse in the Bible. And I got saved. That book changed my life down here, and it changed my life in eternity. One verse, one line in that book. And why did that verse save me? Because I believed the record that God gave of his son, Jesus Christ. I spent 30 years as a Roman Catholic. I never got saved. I spent 12 years in private Jesuit and Franciscan schools. Never got saved. I spent three years as an altar boy, and I never got saved. Why? Because I was never invited to get saved. I was never told about salvation. I was told about Roman Catholic sacraments and the traditions and the, and the teachings of the early church fathers and all that stuff, blah, 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 blah. I was never told how to get saved, but that book, when I opened up that book and I read the record that God gave in his son, John 3.16, John 3.16 will save you every bit as sure as 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Acts 16, 30 and 31, um, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, Ephesians 1, Ephesians 4. Anything in the book of Romans, chapter 9, chapter 10, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 15, John three sixteen will save you just as good as that. But you have to believe the record that God gave of his son. And this morning, that's what we're talking about. We are talking about believing the record that God gave in his son, Jesus Christ. I'm glad I'm saved today, man. Yes. Yes.
was the Fletcher family singing at uh, the Dyson Baptist Church. And uh, I do love to hear the songs of the Fletcher family. Uh, they just, uh, that's, to me, that's just that old time, um, very, very passionate, uh, King James type of singing and preaching uh, that really, really just touches my heart, and I hope it does for you as well. This morning, um, we're talking about believing the record that God has put in his son, Jesus Christ. But before we do that, just a couple of prayer requests today. Um, uh, Mary says, uh, good morning, Mary here. I'm sick with a bad cold and I feel terrible. So we are going to pray for Mary this morning uh, that God would give her a touch and a healing. Um, Bad colds and flus really do make you feel terrible. I haven't had one for a number of years, but I can remember about four years ago, I had the flu and, and I felt like I was at, at death's door. And uh, But amen, she feels terrible, but she's here this morning. So we're going to pray for you, Mary. Um, uh, Lori Ann says, my neighbor Trinia packed up her SUV a few weeks ago and disappeared. She's a military veteran with a lot of mental health issues. She was supposed to have gone downstate to check into the veterans hospital, but she never did. And her elderly mother is worried about her. So we're going to pray for Trinia this morning. We're going to pray for Jesse up in Maine to get saved. We're going to pray for Jeanette's sciatica. Um, uh, Eminem says, please pray for Sarah a 41-year-old married woman with a 9-year-old son who was diagnosed with stage 4 bone cancer and who was going through intense chemo, intense chemotherapy. Char says, pray for patience for me. I don't like my church. We're going to pray for Char too. 
Um, and also, um, many of you know that we support uh, a lot of missionaries and a lot of different churches around the world. And every month we send out over 600 King James Bibles around the world to pastors and missionaries who are planting and starting churches. Um, uh, Pastor Moang from the Fundamental Bible Fellowship Mission of Myanmar in Southeast Asia he wrote to us this morning, and he's asking for some books, uh, asking for some Bibles, and uh, it is very expensive when we send these books out. When I sent a case of Bibles to Pastor John Rhee, um in the Philippines a couple of months ago, uh, the, it cost about $240 to buy a case of Bibles, and it cost about $260 to ship those Bibles there. So um, we... We can't answer every request that we get because some of them are just way too expensive. But even the ones that we that we do do, um, those are fairly expensive as well. And uh, we would love to take on Pastor Mwang from the Fundamental Bible Fellowship Mission of Myanmar. Um, uh, and we are looking into what the shipping cost will be for the books that he needs. But I would like you, one of the things I want you to pray about this morning is um, supporting the NTEB Free Bible and Gospel Track Program. And uh, the reason why that we're able to do these things and, and to support pastors around the world and in the Philippines and in Asia and in Europe and in Africa the reason that we're able to do these things is because you guys donate and you guys pray for us and you send us in the resources that we need so that we can send these Bibles out. And I would love to take on many, many more missionaries, um, but it's expensive. So uh, when we're praying this morning, I would like you to pray about becoming part of the NTEB Free Bible and Gospel Track Support Team. And uh, we need donations. We, we need you to be generous. We need you to send in money so that we can send out Bibles to places like the Fundamental Bible Fellowship Mission of Myanmar and uh, Pastor Danny and Pastor John Rhee. And uh, right now we're doing about 600 King James Bibles per month. And I would love to do a thousand. I would love to do fifteen hundred per month. But in order to do that, you guys need to support it and send in donations. So please pray about that this morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you and and uh, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you, God, for your faithfulness. And we're going to be talking about your faithfulness this morning. And we're grateful. And we're thankful. I'm grateful and thankful, Lord. When you woke me up this morning, I, I opened my eyes and the first thing I said was, Amen, thanking you, God, for giving me another day. And um, with all the things that we've been through in the last 16 months and all the people that have died and the lockdowns and all this, the virus and all the conspiracy theory and the intrigue and the new world order and the rising spirit of Antichrist, I really don't take each day for granted. Every day that the Lord wakes me up, I am, I am truly, truly grateful. And the fact that I can have food on my table and a roof over my head and clothes on my back and come to this studio and fire up this machine and turn on this microphone and all these things that God has provided because he's faithful, I'm grateful every single day. And Lord, um, we are grateful this morning. We are grateful this morning, and we come before you and ask you to meet with us, Lord. We ask you, Father God, to, to be our, our honored guest this morning. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man shall open the door, I will come in unto him and sup with him and he with me. And uh, Lord, we open the door to you this morning, and we ask you to come in and sup with us, Lord. As we open up your word, this King James Bible that is literally bathed in blood. And we thank you and we praise you, God, for this time. And uh, Lord, uh, um, 
We thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and your faithfulness. And we commit this time to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, before I jump right into the sermon, I want to answer a message that we got while this program um, was going on, I guess about 40 minutes ago. And um, uh, a woman wrote to us and said, um, what is the right thing to do if they come to my door? The Biden campaign has been saying that they're going to send out uh, government officials and they're going to knock on the doors of people who have not been vaccinated and they're going to try to encourage them to get vaccinated. So this woman wrote this morning, she said, um, if they come to my door and try to take me to a camp to execute me, should I defend my life and shoot them or should I let myself be taken to die? She said, I am in need of feedback because we will all face this situation soon. And she is right. We will all face this situation soon. If the Lord tarries, we will absolutely face this situation soon. But fortunately, (laughs) fortunately, we have the record that God has left. Turn to Acts chapter 20, please. Turn to Acts chapter 20, please. Um, We have the record that God has left, Genesis to Revelation, and the apostles were faced with something very, very similar. The apostles, Peter, James, John, Paul, Matthew, Matthias, Bartholomew, Philip, the apostles were faced with something very, very similar as well. They were faced with the Roman government, which would soon become the Roman Catholic Church, the greatest persecutor of Christians in human history, And the apostles were living in a time where government officials were knocking on people's doors and were taking them away. In fact, the Bible says about Paul that before he was saved, that he would, uh, he had letters. He had letters from the presiding elders. And in Acts 22, uh, 5, it says, as also the high priest does bear me witness in all the estate of the elders, uh, from whom also I received letters on to the brethren uh, and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. So before Paul got saved, Before Jesus knocked him off his horse, Saul was one of those people. You read the end of Acts chapter 7, and it says that Saul was consenting unto the death of Stephen, so much so that he held the coats of the people who killed him. And Saul was one of those people who would come knock on somebody's door and take them away because they believed in Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul ended his life when somebody knocked on his door and took him away for his faith in Jesus Christ. So this idea of having a knock on the door and being taken away to a place we don't want to go, this is not a 21st century phenomenon. This has happened before many, many times, and we read about this In our New Testament, in Acts chapter 20, verses 22 through 24, we read this. Acts chapter 20, 22 through 24. And now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, Paul said. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry 
which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. That's what Paul, the greatest Christian that ever lived, the only apostle who says three times that we are to follow him, that's what Paul said about being persecuted for Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, Paul again talks about his impending death. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Are you starting to see how the Apostle Paul handled persecution? Are you starting to see how the Apostle Paul dealt with uh, the government arresting him and then eventually taking him to a place where he was executed for his faith in Jesus Christ? Now, I want to ask you a question. Can you show me a verse where the Apostle Paul fights back? Can you show me a verse where the Apostle Paul went out and got himself a sword? Can you show me a verse where the Apostle Paul tells his followers to go arm yourself and fight back? I don't think you can because those verses, well, I've never found them. Maybe you know where they are. The Apostle Paul never fought back. The Apostle Paul went to his death, persecuted by the government, persecuted by his fellow Jewish uh, brethren, and executed by the government of Rome. So, the question that was asked this morning, what should I do when the government knocks on my door? Open the door and say hello. Invite them in. Ask them to have a seat. Give them a cup of coffee. That's what the Bible says to do. And then when you're talking with them and they ask you, hey, Have you been vaccinated? We'd like to talk to you about taking the vaccine. My answer is going to be, hey, have you been saved? I'd like to talk to you about your salvation. That's how I'm going to handle it when they knock on my door. That, I believe, is the rightly divided, dispensationally correct New Testament Pauline way to answer that question. And what happens if eventually the Biden administration takes me away to a concentration camp to execute me? For I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of right. Are you starting to see the idea here? Don't get your Christianity from Alex Jones. Don't let people push you into something that the Bible warns you against doing. When they knock on your door, be pleasant, be civil, be polite. Tell them about faith in Jesus Christ. Ask them if they would like to know how they can avoid hell and go to heaven when they die. That is the Christian response. Rightly divided. That is the example of the Apostle Paul. Now, I want you to think that should you ever be in that situation, and if the Lord tarries, that situation will come. But, I want you to think that should you ever be in that situation, that's actually an honor. Why do I say that? Turn to John chapter 21. 
Turn to John chapter 21. This is what Jesus said to Peter after his resurrection. John chapter 1 verses um, 18 and 19. John 21, 18 and 19. This is Jesus talking to Peter. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou was young, thou girded thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he to Peter, signifying by what death he, Peter, should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. Peter gave glory to God by going to his execution willingly with the praise and testimony of God on his lips. The Apostle Paul did exactly the same thing. Remember, if you call yourself a Christian, if you say that you've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary, then these are our marching orders. This is doctrine for me and you. And when the Apostle Paul says that he doesn't count his life dear unto himself, and he is willing, he is willing to go to his death to keep the faith, to finish his course with joy, why would the Apostle Paul say, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. Do you think that the Apostle Paul was thinking about what the Lord Jesus Christ did when he went to the cross? Remember, Paul's the same guy who wrote Hebrews. And in Hebrews chapter uh, 12, verses 1 and 2, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, also written by the Apostle Paul. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. What is Paul saying here in Hebrews chapter 12? He is saying that Jesus Christ went to the cross joyfully. Joyfully. And that's why Paul in Acts chapter 20 says that I might finish my course with joy. The Bible says that we are to count it all joy. James chapter 1 verse 2, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Not temptation for sin, but this word temptation meaning a trial. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So, I just wanted to spend a few minutes on that topic, because that was a really good question that that person was asking. When they come for me and knock on the door, what should my response be? Your response should be the Apostle's response. Your response should be what the Apostle Paul did when he was in almost exactly the same situation. He preached. In Acts chapter 26, we see Paul standing before the king. He is bound with chains. He has been arrested. 
And what does the Apostle Paul, when he is granted an audience with King Agrippa, what does Paul do with that time? Does he start shaking his fist and talking about, let's make Israel great again? No, (laughs) Paul didn't waste one second of his precious time with the king on any of that junk, no politics, no nation building. The Apostle Paul, go and read it sometime. In Acts chapter 26, the Apostle Paul witnesses to King Agrippa about his soul. And when Paul was arrested and bound in chains, he didn't waste his time with political nonsense. He didn't try to make Israel great again. He used his his audience and his opportunity to preach and teach the gospel of the grace of God. So, when they knock on my door, that's what I'm going to do. If you're a Christian, if you're a follower of the Apostle Paul, he says, follow me three times. If the Bible is meaningful to you and you want to do God's will, then Paul has already shown us how we handle these situations. And that's how I'm going to handle it. I'm not going to get a sword. I'm not going to get a gun. I'm not going to start an insurrection. When they knock on my door, I'm going to invite them in and I'm going to preach to them Jesus Christ. And whatever happens, happens. Why? Because I don't count my life dear to myself. I am willing to lay it down for the cause of Jesus Christ. And you should be too if you're a follower of of Jesus Christ. So I hope that that answered that question. Um, And let's get on with today's message. We are talking about the faithfulness of God. God is faithful. But one of the problems that we have is when we don't believe the written record that God has left for us, 1 John 5, 10 through 12 says we make him a liar. 1 John 5, 10 through 12 says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believed not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record, that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. The very next verse says this, 1 John 5.13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know, K-N-O-W, that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of of the Son of God. One of the things that I was taught during my 12 years in Catholic school and during my nearly 30 years as a Catholic, I was taught by Father Mike and Father Kevin and Father Bob and by the Monsignors and Bishops at my high school, I was taught that I cannot know where I'm going to go when I die. And the reason why I was told that I cannot know, because Roman Catholic theology does not allow for knowing where you go when you die. If you've ever spoken to a Roman Catholic about heaven, if they're a good Roman Catholic that believes what they have been taught in the Catholic Church, they will tell you 10 out of 10 times that, well, I hope that I'm going to heaven. That's what your average Roman Catholic will say. I hope that I'm going to heaven. When we talk in Titus 2.13 about 
having that blessed hope. That is not a hope like I hope so. The pre-tribulation rapture of the church is not I hope it's true. That is our hope of what we are hoping for because it's coming soon. It is not a question of if it's coming. It's our hope is when it's coming. It is not a hope like I hope it's true because it is true. Because the record that God gave in his son is true. Now, On our Bible study tonight, we're going to be talking about hyper-dispensationalism. And uh, somebody asked me the other day if uh, I had ever written an article specifically about hyper-dispensationalism. And I looked, and I, and I, I don't think that I ever did. Uh, so I thought that it would be a really good topic on our Bible study tonight to talk about hyper-dispensationalism. And uh, if you don't know what that is, you need to tune in. Um, and if you do know what that is, I think tonight's program will be a blessing for you. Um, we are not hyper-dispensationalists. Uh, the Bible absolutely teaches a dispensational theology, uh, but there are people who take it to extremes. And um, uh, we are going to talk about that with the Bible study tonight. But suffice to say that the Bible says that this is the record that God gave of his son. And this is the record that God gave in his son. But in Acts chapter 26, we see that as part of the record that God gave, in his son and of his son, Jesus Christ, part of that record is Jesus appointing the apostle Paul as our apostle. Acts chapter 26, this is what Paul said. I was talking just a few moments ago about what Paul did when he was brought before the king, and he used that time to preach and teach the gospel of the grace of God. And here in Acts chapter 26, verses um, 15 through 19, Acts chapter 26, 15 through 19, the apostle Paul is giving his commission that he received of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if we're going to be talking about believing the record that God gave of his son and in his son, Jesus Christ, then I think it would be very, very edifying to look at what that son, Jesus Christ, did in appointing the Apostle Paul to the church. Acts 26, 15 through 19. This is Paul talking to King Agrippa, and he is giving him the commission that he received from the Lord Jesus Christ. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest, but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith which is in me. Wherefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. So, when we're going to talk about believing the record that God gave of his Son, and in his Son, and about his Son, Jesus Christ, we need to understand that Jesus Christ um, picked the Apostle Paul to be the Apostle to the Gentiles, to be the Apostle of the Church Age, and he gave him seven mysteries that he revealed that Paul taught.
taught these seven mysteries to the other apostles, and when the new dispensation of the church age began in Acts chapter 8, Paul was the person, well, not till Acts chapter 9, obviously, um, but when this new thing that we call the church age began, the apostle Paul was handpicked by the Lord Jesus Christ to be the leader of that dispensation. Now, turn to Romans chapter 10. Turn to the book of Romans chapter 10. This is what the Bible says about salvation. If you've ever been one of those people that doubt their salvation, this is for you. I saw earlier in the chat room, I couldn't follow everything, uh, but there was somebody who was having doubts. I think the... Are, they have the username of nobody. And I, I, I wasn't able to read the whole thing, but it looked like that that person was doubting. And I think they were doubting their salvation. I'm not 100% sure. Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 8. Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is exactly what Paul and Silas told the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. That's how you get saved. Now, you may believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and not feel like anything has changed. You may not feel any different. You may have no emotion attached to it. Some people cry. Some people laugh. Some people get very excited. I personally cried when I got saved. And, uh, God gave me assurance of my salvation about two weeks later. But whether or not you feel like you have assurance of salvation, the first point that I want to point out to you is that when we read in 1 John chapter 5 that he who does not believe the record that God gave in his son has called God a liar. So how do we apply that? We apply that to places like Romans chapter 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You don't need any sacraments. You don't need anybody else praying for you. You don't need a, a priest, a pastor, or a rabbi. You don't need to do it in a certain way, in a certain location. You don't need to be on your knees praying. That's not, there's none of those things here in these verses. Paul is talking specifically that after you have heard the gospel of the grace of God, and if you shall confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. That when you're presented with the claims of the gospel of the grace of God, that you believe what you have been presented with, and you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all there is to getting saved. It is the easiest thing 
in the world. All my children got saved before the age of eight years old. Now, you might say to me, well, that's not possible for a five-year-old boy to get saved. It is possible because that's what happened. And it wasn't any, I didn't put any pressure on him. I was just tucking him into bed at night and we were getting ready to fly on the airplane the next day. And my son, five years old, looked up at me with tears in his eyes and I asked him why he was crying. And he said, what do we do if the plane crashes tomorrow? He was five years old and he was worried about crashing um, in the flight that he was going to take. And, and he said to me, what do we do if the plane crashes? And I said, we're going to trust Jesus Christ to take us home to heaven. And he looked at me and, and said, how will Jesus wake us up? And I said, would you like to know how Jesus is going to wake us up? And he said, yes, I would. And I gave him the gospel in the simplest way that I could give to him. And he prayed to receive Jesus Christ at five years old. Because Romans 10, 9 says that if thou shalt confess with the mouth, with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart, that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So if you doubt your salvation, over the years I've met many people who um, they're going through a rough time or maybe they're backsliding and they're really feeling conviction and they think they have to walk the aisle and pray to get saved again and again and again. You can only get saved one time. The Bible says that uh, at the moment of salvation, turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. This is what happens when you uh, confess with your mouth, like Romans 10 is talking about. When you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, which is to say that you believe, you sincerely and actually believe that Jesus Christ paid for your sins at Calvary and that he rose from the dead to prove that he had power over um, life and death and death and hell. When you actually believe that and you confess Jesus Christ, the Bible says that this thing happens to you at the moment you get saved. And this is why you can't lose your salvation in the church age. Many times over the years, I've done battle with the people who say that once saved, always saved is a heresy. It's not a heresy. It's Bible doctrine rightly divided from the Apostle Paul. And if you don't believe in eternal security for the church age, you are calling God a liar. Don't call me a heretic for teaching Bible doctrine. If you don't believe in eternal security, you are the one calling God a liar, not me. I'm not teaching something that's heretical. I'm teaching the doctrine of the Apostle Paul. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Ephesians chapter 1, 12 through 14. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed. This is exactly what Romans 10 is talking about. Ye were sealed by that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Do you see what's happening here in Ephesians chapter 1? 
Paul says in Romans chapter 10 that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and God has raised him from the dead, and Ephesians chapter 1 verses 12 through 14 say that when you confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and you believe that he has saved you based on his death, burial, and resurrection, then the Holy Spirit at that moment seals you in unto the day of redemption. Now, redemption is something that you redeem. If you have a coupon, which you can redeem for a free ice cream cone, what do you do with that coupon? You don't hold on to it. You take that coupon, you go to the ice cream place, you hand them the coupon, you redeem it, and in the place of the coupon, they give you an ice cream cone. That's a picture of redemption. You redeem something. So, Ephesians chapter 1, 12 through 14 says, at the moment that you confess Jesus Christ as Savior and believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead, the Holy Spirit sealed you in. And that seal cannot be broken by, by man, by beast, by the devil, by angels. Nothing can break that seal that keeps you secure until either the day you die or the day that you um, are raptured, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and you go up into the clouds to meet the Lord Jesus Christ in the air. Those are the two ways that you can be redeemed after you get saved and sealed in the church age. So, nothing you can say, nothing you can do, nothing you can think can break that seal that the Holy Spirit put on you in Ephesians chapter 1. Now, turn to Romans chapter 8. Turn to Romans chapter 8. And again, all that I'm giving you, I am giving you rightly divided Bible doctrine from the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, who was the hand-picked servant and representative of the Lord Jesus Christ and commissioned to preach and teach the gospel of the grace of God. If you don't believe any of what I'm telling you this morning, you are calling God a liar because I haven't given you my opinion one time. I haven't given you an interpretation one time. I am simply reading these verses to you, and we are talking about what they mean. And if you don't believe these things, then 1 John chapter 5 says that you are calling God a liar, because these are things that God has testified within the record of his Son that these things are true. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 33. Romans chapter 8, 33. If you have doubts, these verses that I'm about to read to you are some of the most comforting verses anywhere in the Bible written by the Apostle Paul, who is our Apostle. We are told to follow him. We are told to believe what he says. And this is what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. This is the gospel. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? And then Paul asks a really good question. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? 
shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Paul is saying, can any of these things separate us from the love of Christ? Verse 36 says, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded, this is Paul, who was knocked off his horse in Roman in, in Acts chapter 9. This is Paul, who was willing to lay down his life for Jesus Christ and did lay down his life for Jesus Christ. This is Paul, who is the hand-picked representative of Jesus Christ for the church age. So, if he's persuaded, why aren't you? For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I had somebody ask me a number of years ago. Their husband had committed suicide, and he was a believer. And she was told that Christians who commit suicide go to hell. And she came to me, this is like 2012, and she came to me and said, is it true that if a Christian commits suicide, God sends them to hell? And I said, no, that's not true. And she said, how do you know? I said, because Romans chapter 8 says, that nothing can separate the Christian, the born-again Christian, from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Death can't do it. Life, angels, principalities, powers, they can't do it. Things present, things to come, they can't do it. Height can't do it. Depth can't do it. And then here's the kicker. Look in Romans chapter 8, verse 39, And look at those beautiful words, nor any other creature. I want you to put your name right there. If you have a paper Bible, I want you to underline the words in Romans 8.39. I want you to underline the words, nor any other creature. And on top of where you underlined it, I want you to write, that's me with an exclamation point. Because Paul says that he was persuaded that death, life, angels, principalities, powers, things happening now, things happening in the future, heights or depths, nor any other creature, and that means you. I have heard many times from people that um, Shar was saying, that she was listening to a a radio talk show that says that you can walk away from your salvation. That is 100% not true. And the reason why you cannot walk away from your salvation is because of places like Ephesians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14, where God sealed you in. Why do you think when God put Noah and his family and all those animals into the ark, God didn't trust Noah to close the door? Why? Because Noah was a human being, just like me and you. And I'm sure that Noah was a very compassionate person. And I'm sure that as a compassionate human being, when he started to hear those people banging on the door because now it starts to rain and now everybody's terrified and now they want to get into the ark, but it's too late. I am quite sure that Noah would have tried to open the door and let some people in. 
And that's why God didn't leave it in Noah's hands. The Bible says that God sealed them in. God closed the door. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 1 Corinthians 7.23, Ye are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. This is why you can't lose your salvation. Because you were, you were bought with the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary. You were sealed unto the day of redemption. And you were sealed just like Noah was sealed in that ark. We are sealed in the body of Jesus Christ. And you can become an alcoholic. You can become a drug addict. You can become a serial killer. Now, granted, if you did become those things, I'm sure you would have massive conviction every step of the way. But, and it's very rare that those things happen, but they do happen. But even if those things were to happen, you can't drink your way out of your salvation. You can't sin your way out of your salvation. How do I know that? Because Paul, I just gave you about 15 different verses that show you very, very clearly that when you get saved, you are bought with a price and you are sealed onto the day of redemption. And you can't break that seal any more than Noah could have opened the door himself. Now, this is why God says in 1 John chapter 5, He says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself, because you're saved and you have the Holy Spirit inside you. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar. How do you make God a liar? When you doubt what God's word says. When you doubt that his promises are true. All you're ever going to get is a book with black words on a white page with seven seals on the binding. You're not going to get to see God face to face until you die or until you get raptured. You are going to have to take it by faith. God is not going to make a personal appearance just for you or for me. He will at the rapture, but only saved people. You got to believe. You got to believe before you get raptured or you don't get raptured. Um, a lot of the times I hear people saying um, that you have to be living right in order to be raptured. That is 100% not true. You have to be saved in order to get raptured. Turn to John chapter 20. We only have about four minutes left. But turn to John chapter 20. We all know the story of the Apostle Thomas. He's called Doubting Thomas. And Jesus rebukes him. Jesus answered his prayer, but then he gave him a very strong rebuke. Why did Jesus rebuke the Apostle Thomas? Because Thomas was basically calling him a liar. For, uh, John chapter 20, verses 26 through 29. John chapter 20, verses 26 through 29. And after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut and stood in the midst. That's a pretty good trick. He teleported himself and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. Be not faithless, but believing. Now Thomas finally believes. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. And here's the rebuke, because Thomas called him a liar. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, 
because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. If you don't believe the record that God has given in his son, Jesus Christ, the Bible says that you are calling God a liar because you don't believe the word that he spoke. And when he tells you that if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved and sealed unto the day of redemption, and you can never lose that salvation. 1 John 5, Romans 9, Romans 10, Ephesians chapter 1, Romans 8, rightly dividing the word of truth, comparing scripture with scripture. Now, you don't really want to call God a liar, do you? I don't think you do. And I don't think that you realize what you're actually saying when you don't believe promises that God has made. And 1 John chapter 5 says that we called God a liar when we don't believe what he has already declared to be true. Now, um, I got a message while I was preaching. Um, nobody, that's their username in the chat room, um, nobody needs to get saved. And we're going to pray. I don't know that person's actual name. I don't know that person's actual name, but uh, um, if nobody could just put their actual name into the chat room, that would be great. But we're, we are going to pray for you right now, and we're going to pray for you to get saved, and I really hope that you do. Uh, and again, maybe that's already happened because there was a lot of chatter going on during the preaching, and I was obviously not able to follow it all. Um, Cheryl is telling me that nobody got saved, and I wish nobody would tell me their actual name. Um, and I'm looking in the chat room right now. Please give us your first name. Uh, but this is um, this is exciting. This is exciting um, uh, that uh, we have somebody who does not want to name themselves. And uh, okay, uh, we certainly respect your anonymity and your privacy. Uh, but we rejoice with you uh, that you have made a profession of salvation during this broadcast. And amen, amen. Uh, that's why we do these broadcasts. That's why we preach and teach the gospel of the grace of God. Um, and to you specifically, I want you to know in Romans chapter 10, it says, and you can hang your eternal destiny on these words, Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And um, that is amazing. And I was praying as I was driving down here to the studio this morning. I was praying specifically for somebody to get saved today. And um, uh, that's awesome. And we rejoice with you. We rejoice with you that you have made a profession of salvation in Jesus Christ, and we invite you to come back for our Bible study tonight at 9 p.m., uh, and we invite you to become a regular part of these Bible studies and podcasts that we do, um, and um, uh, we really want to see you grow in your faith. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for your your um your blessing and your provision. We thank you, Lord, for this man who got saved, who confessed with his mouth the Lord Jesus Christ from his home, 
And Romans 10.13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that is true. And we're not going to call you a liar, God, uh, because your word says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I just pray, Lord, that this uh, dear soul will continue to come back to these programs as many other people have, like June and Donna Lynn and so many other people. Um, that have gotten saved through this ministry, through these broadcasts, and they have become a regular part of our fellowship. And we hope that you do. We hope that you do. Um, and Lord God, we thank you for this soul who got saved. And for the rest of us, Lord, increase our faith. We don't want to call you a liar, Lord. We believe your record that you have given of your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, everybody. That was a very exciting Sunday service. Uh, we love it when somebody walks the virtual aisle and confesses Jesus Christ as their Savior. Uh, that is just such an exciting thing. Um, tonight, we are going to be talking about uh, hyper dispensationalism. And it's something that we haven't talking to, we haven't spoken about in quite a while. And uh, it's a good topic. It's a biblical topic, and it will help. It will help um, you with rightly dividing. So, Lord willing, we'll see you back here 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time this evening. Have a great Sunday afternoon, everybody. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit. In his blood, this is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. in his
Oh 